I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spend Up ahead the road is dimly Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. Consider this a tour of surprises. You've heard the expression, a sea of wheat. Surprise number one. It's not an expression. Around the 1st of May when the grass is nice and green and it winds out of the southwest and I can smell ripe wheat, and I got to get out there and cut it. So I'm ready to go. Wild horses couldn't keep me back no more then. Surprise number two, other things than wheat can be found growing in wheat fields. It must give you a proud feeling of proprietorship to, to uh, own uh, the only 10 Cadillacs in the winter wheat field in America. Absolutely, it's like owning Stonehenge. It's the most important roadside attraction of our generation. If you're a city slicker and think life out on the plains in Nebraska must be simple and easy, here is a heartbreaking surprise. There's a family right up west here. A man lost his wife and five children in one day from sunrise to sunset on the flu epidemic. And if you believe that the ultimate in recognition is to have your name up in lights, here's another surprise. In Arcola, Illinois, the ultimate in recognition is to have your name up on a coffee cup. The first in this tour of surprises, though, may be the greatest one of all. What would you say if I told you that the greatest center of learning I've ever visited is right here in the piney woods of Arkansas in a wooden shack? A shack with a tin roof bearing an inscription, Hic Habitat Felicitas, here lives happiness. You'd expect the man who lives here to be a dirt farmer or maybe a self-taught carpenter, a doer of odd jobs, and Eddie Lovett is all of those. Then how to explain that inscription in Latin over his door? Well, because Eddie Lovett, who never finished high school and who lives with his children in near poverty out here in the woods, is also a formidable scholar. And this is his library, a lifetime accumulation of thousands of books which he reads day and night and which have transformed the unlettered son of a sharecropper into an educated man. What uh, are you reading right now? I'm reading uh, space and about the great astronauts. I uh, writes them pretty frequently, they write me and I admire the courage because I am an amateur, self-taught astronomer myself. I sat on top rooftops of barns many nights. That's what I'm studying right now. I am studying space. Didn't study last night because I worked up to 2.30 this morning trying to get this place halfway presentable for you all to try to make pictures of it. How much time do you spend reading each day now? Well, I average 12 hours. I average 12 hours a day. You know, in run of, out of 24 hours, I average 12 of them is reading. Are you a fast reader? Not too fast. I'm a slow, steady reader. I ponder as I go along. What about literature? What about fiction? Uh, well, I don't, don't, don't like that too well. But one of uh, one of my writers, I like, uh, I like uh, James Baldwin. I like him. He's good, and uh, I don't like all of his books, but I like some of them. Uh, go tell it on the mountain. Far next time, things of that nature. I like some of that. Who? are your favorite authors? Oh, Lord, they're, they're too numerous to name, but I will name a few. Oh, Lord, uh, uh, Rene Descartes, the great French philosopher. I think that's who I am. And uh, Socrates. Now, Socrates, you know, now he did, really didn't do any writing. He's known as the father of logic. He really didn't do any writing. I am a lover of literature and a lover of knowledge. And of course, Shakespeare, he's, I, is my way of thinking, he's the greatest of them all. William Shakespeare, I got the complete work of it. I have it right here in 40 volumes. Now, I think he was the greatest that's ever lived, now, if in my judgment. Now, some people think otherwise. But what good has all this 
reading done you? You're still living out here in the piney woods. Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, a man uh, is happy wherever he loves. And I love to read. I like to be quiet. And the country is about the best place that I can find quietness to read and study and research like I desire. And I think that it's doing me, chiefly my children, a lot of good. Because the truth to tell, I'm really living for my children. I want to set good examples for them. And the only way I can get my children to do things that I would like for them to do constructive, I have to set the example. Uh, I don't think I've lost anything by gaining knowledge. Because uh, I've been told by my father and also other people throughout the world that man's greatest enemy is his ignorance. So by me pondering in my library and researching, I have declared war upon my ignorance. And the more I learn, the more I learn that I need to learn. And the more I learn that I don't know. And I aspire to drink very deep from the fountain of knowledge. Eddie Lovett steps to the door of his library each afternoon to watch his children come home from school. He gave the children names he discovered in his reading. Joanna, one of the women who discovered okay. Jesus' okay. empty tomb. Okay. Enema, a sister of Nietzsche. Yuri, for Yuri Gagarin, the Russian cosmonaut. He says his children are his greatest happiness. It pleases him that they all like to read nearly as much as he does. And that while he hasn't been able to give them much, the knowledge that they'll always have the library is a deep satisfaction to him. Children are children. Great. Big children. They'll be men and women someday. Hic habitat felicitas. Here lives happiness. Early morning on Main Street, Arcola, Illinois. We stopped into Errol's drugstore looking only for a cup of coffee. What we found was the heart of an American small town. Bill Klopflesch, the manager of the lumber yard, was already there when we arrived, drugstore quarterbacking yesterday's football game with Ray Holterman, the town clerk. Bill and Ray and 160 other regulars at Errol's coffee counter have their names painted on their cups. So before Bob Errol serves you coffee in the morning, he has to look to see who you are. He painted the names on nearly 30 years ago. He laughs and says he thought painting the names on would be easier than washing the same old cups every day. The regulars come and go, and Fanny King, who helps out behind the counter, explains to a newcomer what you have to do to get your name on a cup. You got to drink a hundred cups. A hundred cups. Then you got to wait on the waiting list. A hundred cups. That's five gallons. Pat Murphy, the town mechanic, drank his five gallons 30 years ago and won a crossed wrench and screwdriver on his cup. Once, when Charles Lindbergh got lost in the fog flying the mail from Chicago to St. Louis, he landed on a dirt road outside of town and Pat Murphy helped him fix up his engine and get going again. That was 50-odd years ago and Pat Murphy is still more or less the town celebrity. 162 cups, and everybody up here knows everybody else. But you have to be from Arcola to decipher some of the names. His name is John Clark, and uh, when he went to grade school here, uh, he was called uh, Blackie, and uh, as corny as it may be, that's a black key. Errol's Pharmacy serves no food with the coffee, but on special occasions, somebody goes home and bakes some cookies or cake for the regulars. Ma Bailey took one look at us taping all this and decided it was a special occasion. Underneath. Oh, it's still warm. I went home and made those after I left. <laughs> do you do this often? I've been known to make three and four pans a day, and they don't last long. Who else wants a brownie? How many more? Last night, I said that. We wished we could stay and drink our five gallons and get a cup up there with our name on it, like Verge Roberts, the banker, or Bob Vogel, the tree surgeon, or Big Ben Shields, who was one of the first in town to volunteer for the Korean War and whose cup still carries its star from those days. To have a cup with your name on it, it is such a small thing. But when you die or leave town, they take your cup down from the rack at Errol's Pharmacy. So if your cup is up there, it means that you're alive. The cups may not be such a small thing after all. They are a town register and a history and a confirmation that life goes on in a small American town. 
If you stand out in the middle of Kansas in this season and look off to the north, that's what you see, wheat. That's east, more wheat, all ready to be harvested right now before the next rain or the next wind or hailstorm comes along. This is uh, looking south, and all you see is wheat. There's uh, wheat to the west, too. There is more wheat in Kansas in this season than there are combines to cut it or men to run the combines. And that's where some gypsies come in. They follow the harvest, these gypsies, rolling north along the back roads, packing their combines on trucks and their belongings in old trailers and converted school buses. Small families with big mortgages, usually followed by failed farmers and footloose kids who have been hired on for the summer. Frantically, from Oklahoma in May to Montana in September, they're on the road and in the fields. We came upon upwards of 2,000 such crews cutting wheat in northwest Kansas. They call themselves custom combiners. Their whole summer is a sweaty race against time and weather. There's more than a billion and a half bushels of wheat growing in the grain belt this year. Near Sharon Springs, Kansas, one day, we watched a crew of custom combiners racing a thunderstorm for one big field of it. Farmer Robert Schindler, whose field this is, stood watching the big machine struggle on until the very last minute. Well, that combine's still going. Yeah, he's pulling out, though, now. There's lightning and everything. Yeah. I bet we get a good one before this is over with. How uh, many days will it be now before you can cut this field? Oh, that's hard to say. If it, on the rain, if it rains quite a little bit, well, it might be two or three days. Sometimes it'll uh, dry off real quick. And first, it don't rain too much. You maybe get in the morning afternoon. When we first met custom combiner Dean Sheets, who makes this trip every year with his wife and three kids, he was also waiting. So he had a little time to talk. Around the 1st of May when the grass is nice and green and that wind's out of the southwest and I can smell ripe wheat, and I gotta get out there and cut it. So I'm ready to go. Wild horses couldn't keep me back no more then. When you cut wheat, you cut wheat. Go early in the morning as late as you can at night. Then the elevator will shut you off. I've cut wheat. Uh, I've started one morning in Oklahoma here a couple years ago at 8 o'clock and went to a quarter to three the next morning. With an old timer named Orville Schmidt running the other combine and a 17 year old named Craig Moses driving the truck that unloads the wheat on the go, Dean Sheets custom combining crew put in 15 and a half hours out here today. They stopped once for 18 minutes when Connie Sheets drove out to the field with sandwiches and a couple of gallons of Kool-Aid. What they talked about while eating was the weather and the wheat they still have to cut before they can join the other gypsies headed north toward Nebraska and more wheat. We were just coming over this little rise on Route 66 west of Amarillo and I said, will you look over there? That looks for all the world like 10 Cadillacs nose down in a wheat field. So we uh, stopped the bus and came out here and found that it was 10 Cadillacs, nose down in a wheat field. There they were in a perfect row, tail fins resplendent against a Texas sky of blue. At first, we thought somebody might be trying to raise little baby Cadillacs. Then we thought maybe the farmer just parked them this way each year after he bought a new model. Then we thought we better ask whose wheat field this was. That's how we met Stanley Marsh III. He's in oil, cattle, banking, real estate, and art. It's his wheat field, and they're his Cadillacs. Stanley Marsh III came out to meet us wearing a Mad Hatter hat with a Cadillac crest, and we knew we were in for it. When people say to you, uh, what are those uh, 10 Cadillacs doing out there in your wheat field, uh, what do you answer? Depends on who they are. When I get a chance, I lie to them. I tell them it's for an Elvis Presley movie, or it's for Evil Knievel to jump over. Or maybe it's the caddy cult, and it's the new mother church for a home religion. I tell them whatever strikes my fancy. But if, well, I, if I ask you, what would you tell me? Well, I'd have to tell you the truth. The truth is it's a roadside spectacular sculpture made by a group called the Ant Farm, 
architects from San Francisco. From 48 to 64, that was the American dream, the Cadillac fins. They were the American dream because they were so badly made and so cheap that after two or three years, anyone could have one. It must give you a proud feeling of proprietorship to, to uh, own uh, the only 10 Cadillacs in the winter wheat field in America. Absolutely. It's like owning Stonehenge. It's the most important roadside attraction of our generation. I see somebody stopped over there by the road now. Just some tourists having a good time, taking a look. And asking some questions of themselves, no doubt. Yeah, usually. They'll come wandering over in a little while, probably. We'll tell them it's a windbreak. <laughs> Before it was all over, Stanley Marsh III had us over for supper and everything and explained eloquently his theory of art. It was wonderful. But we won't remember anything he said as long as we'll remember the sight of a cowboy herding steers out there where the tall tail fins grow and the traffic heads west on Route 66 and the Texas sun goes down on the chromium bumpers of the American dream. Nebraska folklorist Roger Welch sits on a farmhouse porch and sings a song of his state's past. Nebraska is lush and green and easy now, but it wasn't always. Once, it was all heat and wind and grasshoppers and burning crops and browning hills and hunger. We've reached the land of desert sweet where nothing grows for man to eat and the wind it blows with feverish heat across these plains so hard to beat. That's Nebraska land, sweet Nebraska land, as on my burning soil I stand. I look away across the plains, and I wonder why it never rains. Jules Sandoz was one of the first settlers in the sand hills of western Nebraska. A stubborn Swiss, immortalized as old Jules in the writing of his daughter Marie. Another of his daughters is still in these hills. Caroline Sandoz Pfeiffer leans against a pile of hay bales she stacked herself and remembers. What was it that made your father stay here in the face of all the hardships? Well, he didn't want to stay. <laughs> he was, periodically, he wanted to go someplace else. And one time he had so many maps of British Columbia that uh, my brother's papered the bunkhouse with his maps of British Columbia. But he stayed here. Well, he couldn't get Mother to move. She said she every time she went, it was from bad to worse, and she wasn't going to get. <laughs> it must have taken people with a great deal of uh, perseverance and spirit of adventure. Yes, well, you can tell by the people that are left here. The, uh, the pansies left. They sold out just as quick as they could and went back to east, wherever they came from, or back to Missouri. A lot of them came from Missouri out here. I think uh, the lack of doctors was the big thing. Because you, if somebody got sick, you, you just couldn't get them to town. It was a day's drive to, to town to a doctor. Uh, so many people died on the influenza epidemic. There's a family right up west here. A man lost his wife and five children in one day from sunrise to sunset on the flu epidemic. And there wasn't anybody to bury these people. Everybody else had the flu. And uh, so they, the neighbors did come in and they carried them out to an outdoor building and stacked them up like cordwood. And th that was the only thing they could do. Some died that way. Some hanged themselves or went insane. Some lived long enough to get out of here, like the man who carved on the door of his shack 30 miles to water, 20 miles to wood, 10 miles to hell, and I go on there for good. Some few lived and stayed and changed Nebraska from a desert to a garden in their lifetimes and changed the words of that old song into paradox. Sing it one more time for those who stayed. Our horses are a bronco race. Starvation stares them in the face. We do not live, we only stay because we're too poor to move away. From Nebraska land, sweet Nebraska land, as on my burning soil I stand, I look away across the plains, and I wonder why it never rains.
Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way. I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years I've been a wonder Just when I think I'm near the end I always see the road is bending And I wonder what's around